Let's open up the Bible here. How many of you have your Bibles? I'll let, come on. All right. Hold up your phone. Hold up your Bible. Let's open it up. I have a word today, and it's simply this. And before I say this, I had no idea about the unprecedented rainfall here in California. No idea. I came here. I was driving around. I came here what, two years ago, and it's beautiful, and it was nice, and I saw the mountains outside of my hotel room. But I literally, this is probably not good, but I did it nonetheless. I was driving, and I was looking out of my window. I'm like, wow, it's so beautiful. So I'm trying to drive responsibly and take pictures. <laughs> don't ever do that. Not good. Please don't do that. Um, I did it when I was stopped at the, the red light, but then it's terrible when the red light turns green and people want you to stop taking your pictures. It's beautiful. It's lush. It's green. Why? Unprecedented rain. I believe it's a sign in the natural of what the Spirit of God is doing in the nation, but specifically, not exclusively, but specifically in California, God is moving with power. And in order for us to move appropriately in the days ahead, I have a dear minister friend who says it this way, when you know what time it is, you know what to do. I want to know what time it is in the Spirit. And I've got good news. Even though the Bible does talk about the end times, last days, and I think it's healthy to study the book of Revelation, Ezekiel, Daniel. Jesus is coming back. Amen? But did you know God had a promise concerning the last days? God himself. Listen, if God has a promise or a prophecy about the end times, I want to pay attention to that. And it says in the book of Joel, chapter 2, in the last days, talking about the times we're living in, Joel does not say the latest and greatest New York Times bestselling prophet says. He doesn't say the chart on the wall says. Joel doesn't talk about antichrists or one world currency or conspiracy theories. Listen, there's healthy conversation about some of that stuff, but God speaking to the prophet Joel could have talked about anything concerning the last days. Am I correct? God has the right to have focused on any emphasis concerning last days, end times. But do you know what God said about the last days? He said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirits. On what? All flesh. Not just some. Not just charismatic, Pentecostal, Christian, Holy Spirit-filled flesh. He said, all flesh. Will all flesh receive Jesus? Sadly, no. But his heart, God's heart, is that all flesh would receive him. That's what time we're in right now. Since Jesus died, rose again, ascended to heaven, and sent the Holy Spirit, we have been living in the time of outpouring. We have been living in the last days, end times. I do believe Jesus is coming back. You can vote yes, you can vote no. It doesn't matter. He is coming back. But between... Pentecost and Jesus coming back, we are living in a glorious season, a time called the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So that tells me biblically what time it is. It's time for the reign of the Holy Spirit, R-A-I-N. And again, how amazing, how dare I say prophetic it is, California experiencing unprecedented rain. I told you to open up your Bible. I didn't tell you where to go to. Zechariah 10, verse 1. An interesting place, close to the end of the Old Testament. Sometimes, admittedly, I wish I had tabs in my Bible so I could easily find it. You can look in the table of contents. You've got Nahum, Habakkuk. I know these are all very popular. Zephaniah, Haggai, and Zechariah. And if you don't get to it, that's fine. I'll, I'll read it. Zechariah 10 verse 1 says this, ask rain from the Lord in the season or the time of the spring rain. From the Lord who makes the storm clouds and he will give them showers of rain to everyone the vegetation in the field. Ask for rain in the time of rain. Well, we can see right now, we're talking about Asbury I've got good news for you. On the basis of the Bible and on the basis of what's happening right now in the earth, it's raining, spiritual rain. And sometimes God will release natural things like rain in California to confirm what he's doing in the spirit. I don't believe in being all woo-woo about those things. Not everything is prophetic. 
Sometimes things are pathetic, uh, they're pathetic, not prophetic. <laughs> but there are things that are so unusual, like that. There's Asbury. There's, I think last time I checked, 30 universities and colleges that have been experiencing outpourings of the Holy Spirit since Asbury. And I love it when I start hearing that some of them are secular universities, like Texas A&M. I know Baylor's kind of in the middle. I think LSU in Louisiana. God is pouring out his spirit. So why is it that it's spreading like wildfire? I'll tell you, a lot of these people, a lot of these students heard the testimony about what God did at Asbury, and guess what they did? They recognized it's time for revival reign, so we're going to ask for it. This is not just for colleges and universities and churches. This is for you and your household. This is for you if you're feeling dry and thirsty in your relationship with Jesus. I believe today, by the end of our time together, I even sense it and feel it right now. Not to hype, not to exaggerate. I believe you can experience the rain, the refreshing presence of the Holy Spirit. We need him. We need him for the days ahead. It's not easy out there. But we can do it and we can be empowered to live out there because of what we receive, Pastor Josh, when we come together in here. We cannot forsake the corporate gathering. Do you know why? Because I, I got to be honest and vulnerable. I got my degree in revival history. I love it. I went to Asbury. The spirit of revival was there. It was genuine. It was pure and precious. But I started to argue with God. I'm like, God, is this revival? Is this an outpouring? Is this awakening? And I started to succumb to some of the chatter that was going on social media where everybody was trying to dissect what God was doing as opposed to celebrate it. And the Lord spoke to me. This is how he talks to me. He's like, Larry, you should know better. <laughs> what? It's like, Larry, you spent a lot of money and a lot of time on a degree where you studied historic revival. You should know what Asbury is telling you about what time it is in the spirit. I said, what do you mean? And of course, he had to give me scripture. He said, Asbury, and this is why the corporate gathering is so vital. He said, Asbury and all these colleges and universities are a demonstration of Acts chapter 2, verse 1. What does it say? Because we're all familiar with 2, verse 2, and suddenly power of the Holy Spirit comes in like a mighty rushing wind. But before there was a suddenly, before there was an outpouring, before it was demonstrative and dynamic and dramatic, do you know what happened? It says they gathered together in one place and in one accord. Could it be? I believe it is. We are in the time right now of one place, one accord. We're seeing gatherings. We're seeing prayer. We're seeing worship and repentance. I propose to you with great confidence what we're seeing in the nation right now, and be encouraged. We are seeing Acts 2 verse 1, and the Lord told me this, Acts 2 verse 1 will produce the inevitability of an Acts 2 verse 2, suddenly dramatic, dynamic, Holy Spirit outpouring. It's not coming one day, someday, folks. I believe we are on the cusp, and how we navigate the days ahead I believe God is looking for people who will be able to steward that level of Holy Spirit outpouring corporately, but also individually. So I just have three points to share today. But before I do that, going back into Acts 10, verse 1, Matthew Henry's commentary on this is very interesting. He noted this. He said, the earth will not yield fruit unless the heavens water it. Making a comment because... In context, that scripture is pointing to the agricultural context or society that Old Testament, Old Covenant Israel was in. So rain was very important. But it talks about in that verse, recognizing the presence of the storm clouds. It says it right there. It says in Zechariah 10 verse 1, from the Lord who makes the storm clouds. Now, Obviously, sometimes we hear the word storm. Oh, we think it's a negative thing. No, we need to be able to recognize the presence of clouds. In other words, signs. I'm not talking about signs in the heavens, per se. I'm talking about right now what we're seeing even in our nation, signs that the Holy Spirit is moving. 
Because when they saw storm clouds, when they recognized storm clouds in that agricultural society, guess what that meant? It meant, okay, we need to pray for rain because it's the time of rain. I declare right now, the storm clouds in the spirit are forming. We're seeing it. I'm not just talking about these colleges and universities, although isn't it amazing? I never thought I'd live to see the day where revival is spoken about in the news. New York Times. Granted, the New York Times didn't quite understand it because they're calling it like Christian Woodstock or something. But you know what? I give them honor. They're recognizing what God is doing. That's a storm cloud. That's a sign. I propose to you that that Jesus revolution movie is a storm cloud. I'll be honest. I've gone to see Christian movies in the past. Some of them are a little challenging to sit through. I find myself praying... Jesus, raise up the J.R. Tolkens and the C.S. Lewises again who can actually receive revelation to come up with really new and innovative ideas as opposed to sometimes the Christian community where we're just, you know, kind of photocopying the culture and using Christian language. Anyway, sorry, that's a rant. The Jesus people, there's something special in that movie. Do you know why? Why? They had no idea that that movie was coming out around the same time as Asbury and everything that was happening. Listen to the interviews of the guy who made it. He's just as shocked and surprised. I propose to you that movie is a storm cloud telling us what time it is in the spirit. So what do we do when we see all this stuff? We ask for rain. We ask for the outpouring of the spirit. Why do we have to ask for it even though it's happening? Because it is happening. I'm seeing it. God is pouring out his spirit. The last thing I ever want to do to anybody, listen, I've sat through enough hype sermons where, you know, somebody would dance and jump in a service and they'd say we have revival. Just because somebody danced and jumped, just because we got emotional because our favorite songs were played, just because even we did extended praise and worship, that doesn't mean revival's here. When revival is rumbling, society, even godless society takes notice. And they're taking notice right now. I just got back, not, not three years ago, not 10 years ago. I literally, a week ago, from Ocala, Florida. And people that we run with very closely, Lance Wall now and Mario Murillo, were doing a huge thing there in the equestrian center. The world, I'm like, the world equestrian center in a horse place? Okay. My wife was navigating the meetings and she was kind of administrating it. So she invited me to come. And here's what I saw, which is proof that there's a time of rain. 4,500 people showed up. That's pretty amazing. And then the first night, Mario does a no-nonsense altar call. You know Mario Murillo. That man doesn't play around. No-nonsense altar call. Repent of your sins. Give your life to Jesus. Hundreds streamed forward. I actually felt like I was witnessing the mantle of Billy Graham in operation. I know it's a man, it comes from God, don't get me wrong, but I haven't seen anything quite like that since the days of Billy Graham. And of course, your mind starts to get cynical. Are these first time people, are these people who come forward in every single service? Listen, I do a lot of revival gatherings and I'm gonna be totally honest. We get what we call, how do I say this very nicely? Revival junkies. Anytime you say Holy Spirit, have a Holy Spirit meeting, they're always up there. They'll come to, you know, you got to appreciate their hunger. Yeah. <laughs> but even if you give an altar call for salvation, they'll come up, oh, brother, sister, is this your first time? Well, well no, but I just want to get touched by the Lord. Okay, well, go from glory to glory. <laughs> but these people were first-time conversions. And I know that because a lot of those people are patriotic Americans, they, they want to see their nation impacted, but a lot of them have never received Jesus. They've never had their sins cleansed. They didn't know what we were singing about today. It's your breath, my lungs. As we were singing that song, I just felt that refreshing presence of the Lord. I started to thank God. Thank you, Lord, for the breath, God, that you have breathed into me. Thank you for the breath of conversion. Thank you, Lord, for the breath of reconciliation that I am actually in right standing with God. These people at this equestrian center never knew that. And that was amazing. Hundreds, I would say at least 400 people came forward the first night to come to receive Jesus. Amazing. 
This was the funniest thing, but it was glorious, and this told me, okay, we are absolutely in the time of rain. Lance Wall now, who's kind of known as a, a guy teaching on cultural engagement, he, he did a 10 a.m. seminar, and he had like two old guys up there, and they were all talking about different strategies for engaging and impacting culture. It was like a Fox News type of conversation. Not particularly, spir- but very helpful. We need that kind of teaching. And then at the end of it, Lance, it's almost like the Holy Spirit said, this is how you need to wrap this up. Lance says, you know what? The only way we are going to shift and shape culture is through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In other words, for you to be completely filled with the Spirit. Those of you who got saved last night, you need the power and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Lance and his wife said, if you want to come forward and receive that, we want you to, we, we give you an invitation. No joke, hundreds of people came forward. I'm like, God, are these the revival junkies? I learned very quickly that they were not. As my wife, myself, and a team, we just started praying for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you could look into the eyes of grown businessmen, well put together, highly influential women. And you knew this was their first encounter with God. My heart was marked, and I recognized we're in the time of rain, and no one's safe. (laughs) no one's and it's good that's a good thing one funny thing and then i'll get back and finish up there was one i love the sincerity we need to be open to kind of um the mess and the unusualness sometimes that comes with this as we saw in the jesus people movie there was one lady who got born again got saved the first night and we were going through the second day we were going through praying for everybody to be filled with the holy spirit and somebody asked this lady she said "Do, do you pray in supernatural languages yet? Do you pray in in tongues? And this lady, from a real sincere place, she said, pray in tongues? I need you to show me how to pray in English first. (laughs) Because she had just gotten born again the night before. Oh, gee, I love that. Shows me the purity and the sincerity of what God is doing. So number one, I have three points. Number one, what time is it? It's time for revival. I want to just let you know, Church of Grace, that's what time it is right now in the Spirit. It is time for revival. It's time for the reign of the Holy Spirit. And I have evidence, as I shared with you in Scripture, but I have evidence in what me and John, what we're seeing right now. God is moving. Number two, and I debated even sharing this because this might sound a little bit out there, but I think you're a robust group of people who can handle this, okay? Number two, before I share that, I want to share this very carefully. What we're seeing right now in revival is precious, and I encourage you, keep going for it. Keep going after the prayer meetings. Keep going after the extended worship. Yes, absolutely, that is revival. That is the spirit of revival. But number two is this. Don't stop short of the Shekinah glory. And you're being like, what, Larry? What does that mean, the Shekinah glory? That word, Shekinah, Shekinah, it is not in the Old Testament, but it is a Hebraic word from the Talmud that describes a very real Old Testament experience, which was what? The visible manifest presence of God. What am I saying? I'm so encouraged by what I'm seeing right now in revival. And the only thing left to come, really, listen, Jesus is coming back. That's great. But the only thing left to come is more revival, is greater. But here's the deal. There is an object to revival. There is a pursuit. Listen, we're not chasing experiences. I'm not pursuing an experience. I always tell people, I'm not after a thrill or a zing. But I am pursuing a person. We are after Jesus. But here's the deal. What word did I just say? He is a person, which means as you pursue him in the scripture, as you pursue him in prayer, in worship, I have to let you know that as you pursue a real person and get to know a real person, Jesus, you will have experiences with him because he's a person. May I just declare that again? He's not a concept. 
I refuse to teach my child that Jesus is simply a theology or an idea. I want my child, my daughter, to have good theology. I want her to know the Bible, but the Bible is not for the purpose of you and I gaining head knowledge so we can win arguments. The Bible, when you go in to read the Word, you should go in there saying, God, I want to know you. And it's not just knowing intellectually. I want to experience you. What I read about in that Word, I actually want to see when I go and knock on those doors. I want to see when I'm in the store. I want to see when I'm at school. I want to see when I'm in the workplace. I want to see everything written in the Word of God. It is not meant for you and I just to grow in knowledge so, like I said, we can win theological arguments. If that's the end result of our quest for Bible study, we are off. I don't chase experience, but I do pursue a person. Even when you read the Word, even when you're in the Scriptures, we're going after a person. We're pursuing the real and living God. So my encouragement is this. Yes to the prayer. Yes to the worship. Yes to the Bible study. But I do believe, and I, I think I'm sharing this because while I've been here in the last couple of days in California, I went on a little revival trip, a little revival pilgrimage to a place in downtown Los Angeles. By the way, LA traffic is no joke. I might actually need some healing and deliverance prayer. I realize the fruit of patience needs to expand in my life. But I went to a little house that is still well preserved called the Bonnie Bray House. What's so significant about Bonnie Bray? 1906, a worldwide global movement was really birthed there. Worldwide global Pentecostalism. This little house, very unassuming, the Holy Spirit fell in a powerful way. Now here's the deal. When I say something like that, I just believe the Lord is giving you a vision for more right now because when I say the Holy Spirit fell there, when I talk about the Holy Spirit falling in Acts chapter 2, where it talks about you know, tongues of fire in the upper room, that was not just, well, I felt God and a tear, a tear kind of went down my cheek, and he will touch you and tears will come. It wasn't, well, they played my favorite song, and I just, you know, I got, the, I got a flutter in my heart. I love that song. That's, that's great that you're connecting with God through that song. And it's a legitimate connection, but there's more. There's more than the tear down the because I, I felt all the feels. There's more than my favorite song. There, the, the, there's, there's a realm, there's a dimension called the Shekinah glory where he shows up. How do I know? How, well, Larry, you're talking about that's Old Testament. Yeah, because in the tabernacle, in the temple, I don't have time to expand on all this. But how many of you know when you study about God in the Old Covenant, Old Testament, there, there was visibility to God. There was visibility to his presence. I feel like even right now, the Lord is provoking some of you. Listen, again, not after an experience, but remember, he is a person, and when he shows up, there will be visible signs of his presence. There was smoke. There was fire. He came like a pillar. You could see his activity. Well, Larry, is that Old Covenant, Old Testament? I've got good news. Because of what Jesus did, I believe we should be seeing more. In fact, he inaugurated the day of Pentecost with something visible. He talks about how tongues of fire, and you know, people stumble over the tongues thing. I found it so provoking that it says, and tongues of fire appeared over them. That reminds me of what we read about in the Old Covenant of that Shekinah, the visible fire of God. So, Larry, are you just saying, what, go after experience? I'm saying this to you as a church and you individually, and, and I'm going to go into point number three, but I want to encourage you. Like I said, this is a little edgy, but it's biblical. Why, why do we want God to show up visibly? And I release this over Church of Grace, even in your prayer times, even as you come together. May the Lord give you a vision for what it could look like with him manifesting his presence here. There is a manifest presence of God. Sometimes you can see it. Sometimes you just feel it. That's what we sensed in Asbury. There was a weightiness of his presence. You knew he was there. It was not an idea. It was not, I think. It was not a good feeling. It was, I know he's there. I think of Jacob and his dream where he said, surely the presence of the Lord is here. I just want to encourage you to pursue that full manifestation of his presence. Why? Well, all I know is this, in the book of Acts, 
where it talks about the outpouring and the unusual things that came with the outpouring. Tongues of fire, a sound from heaven, like a mighty rushing wind. Do you know what it says? It says, when they heard the sound, the multitudes came. How many of you want to see multitudes come to Jesus? We have exhausted every trick in the book. We have, from, from good hearts, but we've exhausted every trick in the book. I declare it's time for the Shekinah. It's time for the, whoa, would you just lift your hands right now? Father, we're not after an experience, but Lord, we recognize you are a person. There is a weighty presence of the Lord right now in this room. And Father, our heart is this, number one, to know you. But number two, God, as it was in the days of Pentecost, it says, when the multitudes who did not know Jesus heard the sound, they heard the phenomenon of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they came and they heard the gospel and they asked the question, what must we do to be saved? Lord, I pray over every person in this church that that Shekinah, that fire would rest on them. Even right now in their physical bodies, they'd be aware of the presence of the Lord. God, we pursue you, but we know you're a person. Wow. Hmm. His presence is here. I was going to try to read point three, but his presence is here. Lord, we ask for increase. We say more, Lord. Lord. Could you just get used to saying that phrase, more Lord? You might be like, well, I have all of God. That's true. But does God have all of you? Wow. Back in the 1990s, you had Toronto and Brownsville and these wonderful revivals. And these people said that all the time, more Lord. And I got a little offended by that because I have all of God. But even right now, Lord, we give you all of us. Wow. Just stay in this moment. Literally, the Lord's interrupting me. As a good preacher, I really wanted to try to finish this, but he's saying, I'm doing a work in this room right now. For some of you, there might be hidden sin. There might be dark things that you don't want to tell anybody about, and you'd prefer just to keep it quiet. Well, here's what the Lord is saying to you right now. He's saying, in the quietness of your heart, just offer that up to me. Romans 12, 1 is the secret to living saturated in the fire of God. God can handle it, actually. God can handle those things. He doesn't want you to hold them back from him. He loves you anyway. I declare that over you. You know that coming out of Church of Grace. You are still in right standing with God. Even though you're struggling, you are forgiven by the blood of Jesus. But you know, God wants you to offer that thing up to him so that he can fill that area of your life with a greater measure of his presence, of his power, of his fire. You have all of God in you. Bible says you're filled with the fullness of God. But my prayer right now for every person in Church of Grace is that more of that fire and presence and Shekinah and visible glory of God would rest on you. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not, well, I've got the Holy Spirit inside of me. and Isn't he proof that I'm saved? Yes, it's the same Holy Spirit, but he just wants to rest on you. Just keep receiving. I, I will say the last thing is number three. We are in the time of rain. But my prayer is this. You would release that rain. Because guess what? The only way for all flesh to experience the outpouring of the Spirit is through you. Think about it with me just for a minute, okay? Can all flesh fit in this building? <laughs> no. No, obvious. All flesh can't even fit in the stadium of it. Greg Laurie is doing, but all flesh is out there, and the way that all flesh will experience the reign of revival, the outpouring of the Spirit is, guess what, for you to go to whatever place God has called you to go to and splash <laughs> is to release what the Holy Spirit's put inside of you. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing even right now. David tells us, Psalm 63, that the world that does not know Jesus is a dry and weary place where there is no water. It's a dry and thirsty place. Psalm 46, he describes it even more saying, you know, the world sometimes feels like things are shaking and mountains are trembling and things are unstable. For people who don't have hope in Jesus, that's how the world is to them. 
But then David in Psalm 46, right after he describes that in verse 1 through 3, gives us the solution to the dryness and the thirst in the world. And do you know what he says? In the middle of describing the conditions we're in right now, he says, Selah, which is pause and think about it, but there is a river. That might sound a little abstract to you. I've got good news though. The river is defined by Jesus in John 7, where he said, speaking of the Holy Spirit, out of your inmost being, out of who? Whosoever believes. Who believes in Jesus in this place? I'm asking you. I hope, I hope all of you do, and if you don't, but guess what? Whosoever believes in Jesus, guess what you have inside of you? There's a river. It's the Holy Spirit. Yes, Holy Spirit is not a literal river, but he flows out of you like a river. <laughs> Even right now, I actually sense that some of you in your bodies are, are feeling the presence of the Lord. It's normal. We don't make it a spooky thing, but he rests on us. We ask you even right now, God, rest on us. The Spirit was moving over the waters in the book of Genesis. God, we ask, Holy Spirit, right now, would you rest on us? Empower us. Send us out, God. May we release your river. There is a dry and weary land out there. You might have dry and weary colleagues at work. You might go into a dry and weary and thirsty school. You might live with people who are dry, thirsty, and desperate, and they have looked everywhere for a source of water. Can I tell you, they will never find it. They will never find that which their soul aches for, but you have it. You carry the river of God. <laughs> 